Maranatha, my loved ones, and welcome to another presentation of our Prophecy Seminar Unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change forever. So we are going to go into a fabulous, amazing study today uh, as we continue to unravel and to unveil uh, the mysteries and prophecies of Revelation. And so let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for the blessing, for the guidance, for the love, for the patience. We ask you, Father, that your Holy Spirit continue to guide us and bless us and direct us so that everything may be done according to your will. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, and we ask and beg these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to join me, please, to Revelation chapter 14 as we've been studying and breaking down this three angels' message, uh, the last warning that God sends to the earth. So please join me in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we've already, I'm sorry, we've already been through the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel in verse 6 and 7. We talked about the second angel, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, verse 8. And we've also talked about the third angel's message, but there's a part of the third angel's message that we have not covered yet. And look at what it says here. Then a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand... He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Notice, my loved ones, that the warning is that anybody that chooses to follow or obey and drink of the wine of Babylon, the the teachings of the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, they will receive the wrath of God full strength. Contrary to those that want to listen to and follow the everlasting gospel, the, the first angel's message, the restoration of these principles, right? Then they will receive the seal of God and they will be protected from these seven plagues, from the wrath of God, which is manifested through the seven plagues of Revelation. And so I've had quite people sometimes ask me, well, isn't, how is the wrath of God, how is that wrath of God, how is the justification, right? How is the the love of God represented in that? And I wanted to share with you a verse that I find fascinating in regards to answering this question. And we find this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. Watch this. Right? The question is, how is it that the wrath of God, how is it that we find the message of justification by faith? And it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified or forgiven by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. For if we were enemies, we were, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so the life of Christ, the blood of Christ, what does it do here? It says we are saved from the wrath. Remember, the wrath of God is going to be poured out against sin, right? Sin is the main issue. Sin is the problem on this earth. It's not family problems. It's not health problems. It's not some of the other problems that sometimes we put money problems, financial problems. Sometimes we put most of the focus on that. No, those are the consequences, right? Those are the the symptoms of the problem. The problem is sin. And so when the problem of sin is solved, then everything else God will start putting in line with, with in regards to his will, right? But it says here that we will be saved from that wrath, that wrath that God is going to do. He is going to destroy. He is going to finish. He's going to unravel the surface of this earth, this life as we know it. And for that, I say amen. But all of those, as we talked about when we mentioned the lake, the lake of fire, that hellfire concept, is that nobody, God doesn't want anybody to be destroyed, right? God wants all to come to repentance. And so when God finishes with this earth, when he consumes it through the seven plagues and eventually the final destruction, what it's presenting and showing to us, my loved ones, is that God has prepared a place for everybody. And so those that choose to follow in the ways of the world, then God is just going to give them the desires of their heart, which will be what? Which will be that final destruction. Not because God wanted to, but because people have chosen to follow in that way. And so... We're going to study today, my loved ones, this wrath of God that is going to be poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. No filter, no mercy. Now go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 7. Let's look at this quickly. Revelation chapter 7, and this is where the protection of God comes. It says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the what? The seal of the living God, as he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So it's telling us very clearly that what? That these four, the angels are holding back the winds, right? The wrath, 
That means that's basically a limitation on the power of the devil. The devil, if it was for him, he would have destroyed all of us a long time ago because he doesn't want anybody to repent. But God in his mercy is holding back the winds, right? He's holding back that moment until there's going to be a time when it will blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. That's talking about the end. And he says, wait a minute, don't let go yet. First, we need to seal my people, he says. And it says, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. That's the wrath of God. That's the final destruction until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And so here is this sealing process that we've been talking about in regards that seal is a representation. It's a symbol. It's a sign of those who worship and honor God and his word alone, right? It's through their lives, through their obedience, right? On the forehead, because it's where have you put your thoughts? Where have you dedicated your mind? Where have you, have you submitted yourself, right? If it's to God and to his word and to his, his will, then it will be manifested through your life. It will be seen that you have the sign, the seal of God in this context. In this end time test, we're talking about the Sabbath test that is going to be the last test on the earth. Contrary, if your mind, if your thoughts, if your desires are towards the beast and following the ways of the world and following man-made traditions and teachings, then you will receive the mark of the beast. And what happens to those people? Well, my loved ones, that is when the seven plagues of Revelation begin to fall. So go with me, please. Let's study this topic of the seven plagues of Revelation. And what I'm going to show you and I'm going to share with you is that the seven plagues of Revelation are going to undo the six days of creation, right? That's what we're going to see. Revelation chapter 15, go with me and watch this. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having what? The seven plagues, for in them is what? The wrath of God is complete. So the seven plagues are the manifestation of the wrath of God. And I saw something like a sea of glass, it says here, mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over the image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, having the harps of God. So these are those that have been victorious through this time period. When the plagues fall, these are ones that's a vision into those that are going to be surviving because they have what? Because they have the seal of God. And so they are protected through the seven plagues. Then it continues to go. Let's jump forward to verse number five. And it said, and after these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was was opened and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chest girded with what with golden bands and so these my loved ones are the seven angels with the seven plagues verse number seven then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed so this is talking about my loved ones the close of probation right every human being on earth has made their decision either in favor of the beast and they receive his mark or in favor of God and receiving his seal and once that sealing process finishes once it's over probation is closed the intercession has been done and now my loved one began to fall the seven plagues. Every human being has made their decision. And as it says in Revelation 21, he that be clean, stay clean. He that is unclean, stay unclean. That's it. That's end. Everybody has made their final decision and during this time period, which is this small time of trouble that is going to happen when the mark of the beast rises up, right? First you have the mark of the beast, that's Sunday law. Then you have the death decree coming across parallel with then the end of the sealing and the end of uh, probation. And so now we're going to jump into my loved ones into Revelation chapter 16 when it starts to talk about the seven plagues. Watch this. We're going to read. We're going to divide Revelation chapter 16 into two parts. We're going to study the first part now and in our next presentation the second half which has to do with the battle of Armageddon. And it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So here's the first one. Notice it doesn't say that the, that the sore came on those that are on earth. Why? Only those that have the mark of the beast. Because why? Because those that have the seal, these plagues do not touch them. Continues to say, Verse 3, then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became like blood. 
And I heard the angels of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who, has to, who is to be, the great I am. Because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have driven them, you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Now, this verse 5 and 6 is very interesting because it's Cain talking about the righteousness of God, right? Talking about how God has been faithful and righteous. Now, where does this come from? Why are they this proclamation through that is happening through the plagues? I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 6 when it talks about the fifth seal. Because it says something very interesting in the fifth seal, which is that time period when the fifth seal, when the, the church is being persecuted, right? The Inquisition was talking about the Protestant Reformation in this time period. And look at what it says in verse number nine. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, how holy and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And so what is the cry of the martyrs in those times, right? In those time periods. It's they're saying what? How long, God? Until what? Judgment comes, right? They were unfairly judged, right? They were sent through the Inquisition, which is these unfaithful, perverted trials that distorted Bible truth. And so as the martyrs were being slaughtered, as they were dying, so they were, the question was, how long will this happen, Lord? How long until your true judgment is going to come, until justice is made? And so the answer to this cry in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, is found in the, during the time of the plagues because now they're saying, yes, now we are showing, Lord, that you have been, that you were not going to let sin continue, that you were not going to let this happen without them, everybody receiving their true justice in this context, right? They were not going to go without them receiving what they deserve. And that's what it's saying here. For they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. For it is their, due, their, it is their due, just due. Verse 7. And I heard, we're in Revelation chapter 16, verse 7. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over the plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed at their tongues because of the pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Let's stop there right now. We're going to stop. We're going to go into verse number 12 and that's what's going to be this presentation. But let's stop at verse number 11. Well, let's read number 12 now while we're at it. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and the water was dried up so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. That's where we're going to stop for today. Now, what are we going to do? If you notice, there is a certain order in the seven plagues fallen, and there's a purpose for that. But it's easier if we show and follow the order of creation in regards to the plagues and how God is going to use the seven plagues of Revelation to undo, to unravel the six days of creation. So what we're going to do, we're not going to follow this order. This, this is an order with a specific reason because of the way things have to unfold. But I want to share with you the way following the order of creation and show you how not only John, but I'm going to show you how actually all of the prophets from before also saw the same scenario. So Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and prophets like Joel and Zephaniah, they all saw the seven plagues. They all saw this destruction coming forth, right? They all saw the end. And so how do they know that? Because they will reveal these things in the past. And so we're going to use not only John, but we're going to use the prophets of the past. And we're going to show how they all saw the same destruction through the seven plagues. So let's begin in the beginning, right? When we go to Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was God and God created everything, right? That's that master statement in regards to God as the creator. But look at what it says in Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was what? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in the beginning, what, how was the earth? It says it was form, without form and void, right? The word tohu, it was empty, it was desolate. There was nothing there, and it says it was on the face of the deep, 
Really what, the, what it's making reference to is that the surface of the earth is actually a, like an abyss. And in Spanish, it actually uses the word the abyss, right? It was empty without form. Unadorned is another way to talk about it. Now, why do I say this? Because then it says on the, in the first day, what did God do? God created light, right? I want you to go with me. Leave your finger there in Revelation chapter 16. We'll be coming back. And go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, watch this. I'm going to show you how Jeremiah is seeing the final destruction of the earth. Jeremiah is watching the final destruction of the earth. And, God, and so he is going to explain this process. But it can get, sometimes it can be perceived to be one thing and it could be another. Watch this. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 23. It says, I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void and the heavens they had no light now you might read that and say oh it's talking about genesis chapter 1 verse 2 right the earth was at with, with without void it was without form it was void but no jeremiah is not talking about creation and genesis he's talking about the earth after the seven plagues watch this as we continue to read I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the, hev of the heavens had fled. I beheld, indeed, the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by what? By his fierce anger. There it is, my loved ones, his fierce anger. The anger of God is represented by what? By the seven plagues of Revelation. And so this is not talking about the earth in its initial stage. It's talking about the earth in its final stage. And so when we go back to verse 23, it says, I beheld the earth and indeed it was without four men void after the seven plagues, after the wrath of God. And look at what it says. And the heavens and they had no light. So day one, God creates light. What does it say here? There is no more light. Light. Are you catching me? Are you following me with that? Now, what did God do on the second day, right? On the second day, God separated the waters. How? Vertically, and that's where the atmosphere, the first heaven was created, which is what we uh, gives us the capacity to breathe, right? Now, is that going to be unraveled through the plagues? Oh, yes. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. Watch this. Revelation chapter 6, and it says on verse number 14. Let's start a little bit before. Let's start on verse number 12. Revelation 6, 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Then the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its light figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Now, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now, verse 12 and 13 historically have already occurred, right? The, the, the earthquake of Lisboa and some other events that represented all of these things. That's verse 12 and 13. But verse 14 has not happened yet. How do we know it? Because it says the sky, the sky, the atmosphere, right? The first, the first heavens says receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. Now I have a question. If the atmosphere is destroyed... Is the earth capable of holding human life? Of course it's not. We would not be able to breathe. Then it says, every mountain and island was what? Was moved out of its place. But I'm talking about the sky, the, the earth as the scroll, right? In that context. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall what? Shall fall down And so what is it talking about, my loved ones? God has undone what? The second day of creation. First day there is light. Second day the sky or the heavens are separated. And God does what? He is dest it's destroyed, right? With this plagues. And so God is undoing again. Is it possible for the earth to sustain human life after this? Oh, no, 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 no. Now, what happens on day number three? Now God separates the water uh, horizontally, right? And what comes forth? The earth... The land, mountains, the valleys, right? The dry land. Is that being undone? We also have uh, plants and the vegetation and the trees and the fruits. Will God undo those things also? Yeah. Well, let's start with the, 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 the land, right? Let's start with the trees and the plants. Go with me to Revelation chapter 16, verse 8. Watch this. Revelation chapter 16, verse 8 says, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch what? to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. Now, if, you, if men are being scorched with fire because of the heat, 
What is going to happen to the vegetation? Will the vegetation be able to survive? No, of course not. It will not be able to survive. Look at what it says in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 26. I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a desert, and all the cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before what? His fierce anger. Again, the seven plagues. What is happening to the fruitful land? It was destroyed. It was laid in ruins. So there's no vegetation. Look at what it says in Joel chapter 1. Verses 10 through 20, the fields are destroyed, the ground mourns because the grain is destroyed, the harvest of the field has perished, pomegranate, palm, and apple, and all the trees of the field are what? Are dried up. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned what? All the trees of the field. My loved ones, Look at how amazing this is talking about. Joel also seeing everything has been destroyed. It says all the trees, all the wilderness, all the, the, the plants, everything has been consumed, my loved ones, right? And so that's just the surface. What about the mountains and the valleys and, the, and, the, and all of the other aspects that come that have to do in the hills with, in regards to the surface of the earth? Well, once again, let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. Revelation chapter 6, verse, I'm not 14, verse 4. Revelation chapter 6, yes, it is 14, I'm sorry. It says, Then the sky receded out of the scroll when it is rolled up. That is this, the atmosphere. And look at what it says. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now, it doesn't say some. It says every mountain and every island, right? Now, I'm from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an island. And so you can make sure that if the whole island is lifted up, people would know about it. I have a question. Has this happened yet? No, it has not happened. Now the question is, how is it that every island and every mountain shall be moved out of its place? Well, it explains in Revelation chapter 16. Go with me, please. Watch this. Revelation chapter 16, talking about what is going to move all the islands out of its place. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 16 and go with me, please, to verse number 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. So there is this great earthquake. There's going to be an earthquake at the end, my loved one, at the end of the seven plagues that is going to unravel everything. And look at what it says in verse number 20. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So that means that the islands just stand up and run off? No, of course not, right? This is figurative language. It's saying what? Everything was destroyed. Everything came to an end. Look at what it says in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 24. I beheld the mountains, and behold, they trembled, and all the hills were destroyed. Why? Because of this great, imposing, amazing earthquake that it is talking about. So, praise the Lord, right? Praise the Lord, for because we can come to the Bible, and we can have clarity and truth in regards to these things. What happened to the third day? God created the dry land. It graduated, he created the trees and the fruits. What happened to all of that? Completely destroyed with the plagues. Day number four, what did God make on day number four? Oh, he created what? He created the, the stars, the moon, the sun, probably talking about those things in, in, our, in our galaxy, which is uh, visible to the eye, right? And so... Is God going to unravel that? Yes, of course. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. Watch this. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Revelation 6, 12, and we're going to read 12 and 13. Look at what it says here. I looked in the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by the mighty wind. Now, we know that these things historically already happened in a local level, but this is going to happen also on, a, on, a, on, a, on the whole world, right? In the end, this is also going to be unraveled. Look at what it says in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, this is parallel to what we just read in Revelation chapter 6, but I'm just giving you a taste, a look at what is going to happen when it covers, when this happens at the end. It's going to be world on the whole level. Look at what it says in Joel chapter 2 verse 10. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will what? And the stars will stop shining. And so there we go my loved ones. Fourth day God created the stars, the moon, the, the sun. It all becomes, becomes undone in that sense. The sun that goes dark, right? And so again, God is undoing 
the six days of creation. Now, what happened on day number five? Day number five is a very interesting day, right? Because on day number five, what does God create? He creates the earth animals, right? So the earth animals are the ones that are created. Now, I'm sorry, not the earth animals. That's number six. On day number five, you have the sea animals and the air animals, right? The sea animals, right? The the, the whales and the dolphins and all these majestic, the eagle and the, the, the hummingbird. What's going to happen to them? Well, go with me. Let's start with the fish. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. Let's start with the fish. Revelation chapter 16, verse number 3. And it says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the, on the sea, and it became blood as a, as a dead man. And notice what it says here. And every living creature in the sea died. How many of the creatures died? Every single one. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water. And they became like what? Like blood. So notice it says that every single animal in the sea, what? Died, right? Now, does that sound like a partial? No, my loved ones. This sounds like a complete plague that has fallen on what? On the seas in the same way that happened in Egypt, right? There are some parallels between the seven plagues of Egypt and the plagues, ten plagues of Egypt and the plagues of Revelation. Now, what about the, uh, the, the animals in the air, right? Look, look at what it says in Hosea's chapter 4, verse 3. And so the land will dry up and everything that lives on it will die. All the animals and birds, there are the animals and birds, and even the fish will what? They will all die. So that's very clear what it's saying there, my loved ones. All of the, ma- all of the animals will die. All of them will be destroyed. Now, <clears throat> Let's put it all together because we know that on the sixth day, what did God create? God created the land animals, right? And he also created humans. Now, will all of that be unraveled with the ten plague, with the seven plagues of Revelation? Uh, it's very clear, I think, that it will, so it will, my loved ones. Look at what it says in Zephaniah, chapter number 1, 2, 3, and 18. God says, I will utterly consume all things from off the face of the earth, says the Lord, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens and the fishes of the sea. And I will cut off man from off the land, says who? Says the Lord. Notice everything is being destroyed. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them, to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord in the fire of his jealousy. All the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all inhabitants of the earth. My loved ones, there is no one or nothing that is going to survive on this surface when the plagues fall. Only who? Only those that have the seal of God will be protected through the plagues. And what the plagues are going to do, they're going to end up, as each plague fall, they're not going to be universal because then the whole thing would be unraveled immediately. But as they, conti- as they fall and continue to fall, you're going to see how people are going to start to be uh, destroyed, right? Ex- except those that have the plagues, except those that have the seal of God on that context, right? And so people ask also, how long is this going to last on the earth? Well, I believe that this is going to last at no, no more than a year, probably maybe less than a year if when we're looking at this, but no more than a year. And you say, how do you come across that? Well, go with me to Revelation chapter 18. Watch this. Revelation chapter 18. If you go here, it's talking about Babylon. And look at what it says in Revelation chapter 18, verse number uh, 8. Therefore, now let's read on verse number 7. It's talking about Babylon. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, luxuriously, in the same measure gave, gave her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, watch this. Her plagues will come when? In one day. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who does what? Strong is the Lord God who judges her. So it tells us here, my loved ones, that what? In one day her plagues will fall. Now, we know already that in prophecy, what does a day, a prophetic day represent? It represents a year. So the plagues are not going to fall on one day. It's going to fall what? In approximately no less than one 
year. We can confirm this in Revelation chapter 6 also. Watch this. Revelation chapter 6, it says in verse number uh, 16, and, the, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the what? The great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? The great what? The great day of the wrath of God. Now we know that the wrath of God is manifested through the seven plagues. So it's not a literal day. It's a prophetic day, right? And some people say, well, wait a minute. I thought that there were no more prophetic times after 1844. Yes, true. There's no prophetic dates in the sense that there's no date setting, but there is still this time period, prophetic time period that is still opened in regards to this last phase of the plagues fallen. And so go with me, please, to Isaiah. I want to show you how a prophet Isaiah saw the exact same thing that Joel, Zephaniah, John, they all saw the same thing. Jo go with me to Isaiah chapter 13, please, and watch this. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 13, and we're going to start on verse number 4. Look at this. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like that of many people. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. That's the battle of Armageddon. We'll be talking about that next. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. They come from far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and the weapons of indignation to what? To destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger. The land, they, to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in the going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold and a man more than golden wedge of Ophir. Verse number 13, therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Oh, my loved ones, this is a, a, a horrible panorama, right? God is saying my wrath is going to come on this world of pain and sin and suffering and rape and murder. I am not going to let this continue forever. I am going to pour my wrath out and I'm going to undo everything, right? But God is not doing it yet. He's waiting. We're still in this time of grace where God is giving us his mercy, his patience is still manifested. But there will be a time, my loved ones, where God is going to put an end to it. So don't play with the mercy and the grace of God, my loved ones. So many people look at these things and, oh, but no, don't. Because understand this, God is love and God loves all of his created beings. Amen. And God's love will is eternal. But his mercy and his, and, and, his, and, his, uh, and his patience is not. The mercy and the patience of God have limits. And it says very clearly this earth is going to be shaken to its core. Look at what it says in Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 23 and 27. I looked on the earth and behold, it was without form and void. And to the heavens and they had no light. For this is what the Lord says, the whole land shall be desolate, but what? But I won't destroy the whole earth. He was not going to destroy it. What Question, why is God not going to destroy the earth? Well, very simple, because it says in Revelation 21 that God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Amen. So what God is destroying is the surface of the earth. In the same context as the surface of the earth was adorned in Genesis chapter 1, God then is going to what? He's going to destroy the surface of that very earth. I want to show you another place where Isaiah talks about this scene. Very interesting. Isaiah chapter 24. Go with me please to Isaiah chapter 24. Watch this. Here God explains why now he's doing this, right? Now is the explanation to why these things are happening. Isaiah chapter 24. We're going to start on verse number 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste. 
distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the masters, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrow, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. Verse 3, the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered. For the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because why? Now here's the reason why. Because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant. Here's the reason why, my loved ones, is why? Because humanity has rejected God's law. They have rejected his principles, the holy principles of heaven. They have rejected that, and they have chosen and decided to want to follow their own laws, their own ways, their own beliefs. And so God is what? He respects it. But this, because of that, that's why we have this earth of pain and sin and suffering and injustices. And God says, I'm not going to let this happen forever. It's, but it's not finished. Verse number six. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and I love this last part, and a few men are left. How many men are left? A few men are left. My loved ones, what does that mean, a few men are left? It's talking about the seven plagues, the same scenario, but a few men are left. That word in Hebrew is the word shawar, which means a remnant. A leftover. I have a question. Who are those that are going to survive through the seven plagues of Revelation? Very simple, my loved ones. It's those that have the seal of God, my loved ones. Amen. That last remnant movement right there, the 144,000. Look at what it says in, Jer in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 26. Nevertheless, they were defiant and rebelled against you, against you and cast your law behind their backs and slew your prophets who testified against them. To turn them to thee, and they committed what? Great abominations. And again, my loved ones, here's this scenario of the abominations, right? Of why the earth is under this condition, why this has happened. It's because of what? The rejection of God's word. And not only that, remember the abominations are these beliefs, these practices, these teachings, these doctrines of paganism that have been introduced in the church. So it's not only because of the rejection of the law of God, but it's also because of how Christianity has been so perverted and distorted through these false teachings that come down from Babylon and distorted everything. Now I have a question. Is it possible for the earth to sustain human life after the seven plagues have fallen? And the answer is no, it's impossible. There's no atmosphere to hold air. There's no plants, right, to feed us. There's no, nothing. Everything has been destroyed. There's nothing. The earth is what? The, the earth, once again, is left in this desolate, void, empty, abysmal state. And so that is the end, my loved ones, of this earth. So why do I say this? Because there are many sincere Christians that believe that the, the kingdom of Christ is going to be, is, is the judgment will come, and then the earth is going to continue in its normal way, in normal patterns, and everything is going to be just fine and dandy. But that's not what this, panor this panorama pictures. It's showing the end of destruction. It's all coming down. Is everybody following me? So it is impossible. And so the question is, that where, are, where are God's people going to be during this time? Well, we're going to see in an upcoming presentation that God is, Christ, remember he says in John chapter 14, he says, I am coming to take you, right? And I'm going to take you to that place I have prepared for you. And so what Jesus is telling us is, I am going to come and take you back home. Let's go read that. I love that verse. Let's go read that so we can put this together. I like to put the puzzle together so we can make it clearer, right? John chapter 14, here we are. Verse number one, let not, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many what? Are many mansions. If it were so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am there, you may also be. So what is he saying? I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? He left. That already happened. Now what happens? He says, once I've prepared that place for you, then he's going to come back and do what? And come again and receive us and take us to that place he follows. So we're going to see that that's that time period known as the millennium. After the second coming of Christ, 
after the plagues because that's what's going to become at the end of the plagues. The end is going to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. And let's look at that. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 16 because that's what it talks about actually in the sixth plague. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 16. We're going to go now to verse number 12, right? So we finished the first part. We've just looked at those seven plagues falling. Now look at what happens in this time. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters were dry, was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So let's stop here for a minute. It says here that the sixth angel pours his bowl out on the river Euphrates. Now the river Euphrates, who does it feed? If you know history, right, the river Euphrates would feed who? Babylon, right? And so many people take this verse and take it literally and say that as the waters dry up, so that the way of the kings of the east must be prepared. So I've come across people, sincere people that say, oh, what that's talking about is that the kings of the east are China, Russia, right, Iran. They're going to come together and they're going to invade Jerusalem. And this is the preparation for the battle of Armageddon, right? And so this is the panorama that they present. But remember something, my loved ones. Remember the principles that we've been studying in regards to prophetic interpretation. And when it says very clearly, when we see very clearly is that John is using what? Things of the past, right? Events, people, places from the past. And he's taking those things that happened literally and locally in that place. And he's applying them again in the end times in regards to the end. So we cannot take this literally. This is talking about, sim, sim, these are symbols that he is using. Now, is there a place in scripture that talks to us about the river Euphrates being dried up and the kings of the east coming and destroying Babylon? Oh, yes, it is. We studied that in Daniel, right? In Daniel chapter 5, if you remember, it talks to us about this scenario where what happened? Where Belshazzar was having this great feast, Babylon and its arrogance, right? They prepared this great big feast and they were having uh, this big, everybody was drunk, this big orgy. But what happened to Belshazzar is that Belshazzar then brought the cups and the, the sacred things of God from the sanctuary and he started to drink of the cup and to do uh, and to and to use what is holy in a common way. What happened? It says very clearly, my loved ones, that as these things were happening, so came the finger of God, right? Mene, mene, tekelu para sing, and God rode on the wall, and the party was over. But as this party was happening, who was on the outside of Babylon? On the outside was the Mede and the Persian army, right? Cyrus, known as the, uh, the, the anointed one, the one that was sent by God to free God's people from Babylon, right? The fulfilling of the prophecy, Cyrus in this case, which is a type or a representation of Christ, Cyrus then goes in and what were the, what were the engineers they were doing? Remember, the walls of Babylon were too wide. You can run two chariots wide over the top. And what, it's, what the history teaches and the Bible confirms is that what happens was that the, the, the Mede and the Persian engineers, they, they diverted the river. They diverted the Euphrates River and the level of the water descended. And so what happened? The, empire, the, uh, the army of the Medes and the Persians came in under the city because you couldn't conquer it on the, uh, through the walls. That's why Babylon in its arrogance said we shall never be conquered. And the armies came in under the city and they destroyed Babylon and of course they were saying oh no they, they you can besiege you can try to siege the city and stay on the outside because the river Euphrates fed them but that same river my loved ones which is what caused their demise and so why do we say this because this is what's happening here right the kings of the east representation of the Medes and the Persians and Cyrus specifically who was the anointed one a type of Christ so then the question is, what does it mean that the river Euphrates, again, that feeds Babylon, its waters dried up. Remember, what does waters, rivers represent? People, tribes, tongues, and nation. So who is feeding Babylon or who is giving Babylon their power? Well, we read this already in Revelation chapter 13. It says that the whole earth, right, the people, nations, tribes, and people are giving it its power, are wanting him to be on the top, and that's how he restores the political power. That's how the wound is healed. But what happens is that as the plagues continue to fall and fall and fall, people are going to be aware that they have been deceived by the system and they are going to what? They're going to take away their support and they're going to get mad at her. And what's going to happen, my loved ones? That's when the kings of the east are going to come. Now, what comes from the east? 
when it talks about the kings of the east. Well, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 1 and 2. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looked toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way to of the east. And his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. What does it say here that God came from? He came from the way of the east. East, my loved ones, are you following me? So God comes from the east, and it says that's exactly what was going on. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 2, talking about that angel. It says another angel ascended from the east, having what? The seal of the living God. One more verse, Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. For as the lightning comes from which direction, my loved ones? From the east, and the flashes to the west so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So when it says that the kings of the east are coming to destroy Babylon, what is represented? It's the second coming of Jesus Christ that's coming with what? With all of the armies in heaven. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19. Look at it, it says it's so clear here. Revelation chapter 19, when you're there, say amen. Verse 11, look at what it says. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him, which is Christ, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does what? He judges and makes wars, right? Again, showing the justice and the righteousness of God to put an end to it. Verse number 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were like many crowns. He had a name written with no one except himself, knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood, and his name is called what? The word of God and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with what? With a rod of iron and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God and he has on his robe on his thigh a name written king of king and lord of lords amen that is the second coming of Jesus Christ that is going to unravel and undo finish with Babylon and during this time it's the battle of Armageddon that is happening that's going to be our next presentation exactly what is that battle of Armageddon and how it's going to come together we're going to see that in our next presentation but my loved ones this has been uh, terrifying scenario that we're seeing, right? Why is it terrifying? Well, it depends on what side you're on. If you're not on the side of God and you're not protected, then my loved ones, it is going to be terrific. And even those faithful during that time that are sealed, they're going to be, they're going to look at this and they're going to be terrified of the things that they're seeing. But what? But they are protected because God has put his seal on them. And so again, this is a very clear statement in regards to what is going to happen in the end time. Remember, God does not want anybody to be lost. God wants all to come to repentance. God is being patient and merciful and waiting until the very end for everybody to make their decision. But I want to re remind you of something that I think we spoke about at the beginning. The Bible says that God is going to give each and every one of us the desires of our heart, which is a beautiful thing, but it is terrifying as well. Why? Because if the desires of our heart are for the things of this world, and we put our heart and our thoughts, right? Once again, the forehead towards the things of this world, God is going to give us those things, right? He's going to let us have it because that's our desire. But understand this, that when God destroys the surface of this earth, when God destroys the things of this world and consumes it with fire, as it's talking about in the seven plagues, if the heart or desire is for those things, then you shall what? Then you shall receive the fire and the wrath of God. Not because God wants to, but because you have asked, that is where your heart is. Contrary to that, if your heart and your desire and your mind, your focus, your, your thoughts are for the things of heaven, then God is going to give you heaven, right? And it's going to be re re represented and shown through your life. It's going to be very clear to others, my loved ones, that you are living a life Worthy and God will put the seal and those that have the seal of God will be protected in the end times. And so that is the joy. That is the, the, the pride. Uh, the, not, let's not use the word pride. That is the, 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 the emotion and the funness of seeing the angels looking at those that want to be faithful and want to be honorable and want to uphold the principles of heaven, my loved ones. And so how is that protection going to come? 
in the end times. I want to close with a wonderful psalm, which is a psalm written for those that are going to go through these end times. Go with me to Psalms chapter 91. Psalms chapter 91 is a psalm written that is going to be in the mind, in the foreheads, in the, in the thoughts of those that are going through this time period of the seven plagues of Revelation. So, psalms chapter 91, we're going to read it. And I want to show you how God is, is a message to God to those people, to his people in the end times. And look at what it says. Psalms chapter 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that works in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at a noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right side, but it shall not come near you. Only, your, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. So here it's talking about what? The pestilence is fallen, right? The destruction, but it will not touch us but we will see the wicked as they are destroyed. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tr thread Upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, says God, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. And I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And to that I say... Amen, my loved ones. This is the message of redemption, my loved ones. Remember, the plan of salvation is to undo the sin, is to undo this earth of sin, is to separate us from sin. And so in the seven plagues of Revelation, God is carrying out his judgment. Now, he doesn't want this judgment to fall on all. Notice this. This is going to fall on those that have not submitted, that have not surrendered. God's people are already going through judgment, right? And as we know in 1844, we're not literally presently there, but we have our representative, our lawyer that is on our side, and he is up in heaven, and he is advocating on our behalf and our side. And so the appeal is what? The appeal is to, it's time to make strong and firm decisions. And I'm not just talking about people that are not in the church. I'm also talking about those that are in the church because the Bible says that most Christians will not be saved. And you're like, what? Yes. Where does it say that? I want to show you Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ talking about the end times. And this is a, a very clear warning to us, to his church. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what? That leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow, verse 14, is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. He's not talking to the world, my loved ones. He's talking to us. He's talking to his church. As we talked about in Matthew chapter 24, when it talks about the times of Noah, right? They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage. It's talking about what? It's talking about God's people in the end time that they were not focused. They were not not only preparing themselves, but being the instruments of God to prepare others. It says that what happened? The, 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 the flood came. The destruction, the plagues came. These are all parallels, right? It came and destroyed them. Why? Because they were more interested in following in the ways of the world. And so the appeal is not just to those that are living their life outside of the will of God, not seeking God, but it's also to us Christians who, as it says in the church of Laodicea, are lukewarm, right? We think we're fine. We think we're doing just great. Oh, we're fine and dandy. We're ready to go. 
No, that is not the attitude. As a Christian, we should be uncomfortable with what we're doing. We should be uncomfortable in the sense of we should not be satisfied. We should not be conformist. We should be striving and searching daily for more and more of the, of the grace of God, of the love of God, of the mercy of God, of the knowledge of God. That's the evidence. That's one of the great witnesses. Is it your desire to study the word of God more? Is it your desire to pray more? Do you, do you struggle with yourself? Do you battle with yourself? You're saying, I know I need to spend more time with God. Well, my loved ones, that is what God, that's the desire, that's the sh- proof, that is the evidence that the Spirit is working in your heart. But if you're happy with your spiritual life, if you're just sitting there and saying, oh, you know, I'm good, I'm just going to ride this out, you know, I've been in the church my whole life, I was raised this way, I know the message, that does not matter. Now, don't get me wrong, that information is not invalid. That is great information to know the wonderful truths that we are studying, that we have learned. But is it enough just to know, or do we have to live and apply this to our lives, my loved ones. Because that's what this is all about, my loved ones. It's about what? It's about seeking the righteousness of God. It's about seeking the glory of God. It's about wanting to dwell in His presence. It's about wanting to spend time with Him daily. That is the only way. Those that will be saved, those that will choose death over life in the end, when that moment comes, are those that have fallen in love with God. And I go all the way back to Daniel chapter 3. Those three Hebrew boys... What? They preferred to die than to dishonor God's God, to dishonor His law, His Ten Commandments, to disobey them. Ten Commandments, that second commandment in Daniel chapter 3. In the end, it's commandment number four that is going to be the test. In the end, the test of loyalty is going to be, are we loyal and we're going to uphold all of the principles of the Word, all of the principles of the Ten Commandments, including the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. That is going to be the final test as we have talked about through the mark of the beast, the beast, the image of the beast. That's the final scenario. That's the final conflict on this earth. Who do you worship? Who do you obey? And if you do not learn to worship God now and to live for God now and to surrender to God now and to submit to God now, it will not happen in the end. We need to learn now to be completely dependent upon God for everything. It's His righteousness, my loved ones, that upholds us. It's His righteousness, His mercy, and His grace that gives us what we have. And it's all we can do is surrender and give our hearts over. All we can do is have this daily give over, this daily surrender. Why? Because if we do not surrender daily, if we do not give in daily, our flesh is going to dominate. Even when we surrender daily, even when we desire that, we still have a battle between the flesh and the spirit. So that's going to continue until Christ comes to give us a new body. But for now, my loved ones, this is what he's asking for. Submit, study, consecrate. It's not worth not doing it because the consequences are eternal life or eternal death. And so I don't know about you, but I choose. I want to. And my battle, my real battle of Armageddon will be on this topic is against myself. So I ask you, do you want to choose and live for God? 